you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, participate in this uh, conference. Uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, the uh, organizers in particular. I would like to congratulate Marilena Zaccheos uh, for putting together uh, this uh, conference uh, and also uh, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. I want to welcome my very, very good friend, uh, Mark Donfried, the founder of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy uh, and the general director of the uh, Institute and uh, congratulate the Institute for uh, doing such a remarkable uh, uh, job in promoting uh, cultural diplomacy and uh, dialogue and reconciliation. Uh, being a committed pacifist, uh, I chose to speak on a topic that is very close to my heart. Uh, truth and Reconciliation Commissions, an invaluable tool for peace building. It is undoubtedly a rewarding achievement that since the establishment of the, second, uh, of the United Nations 69 years ago, we have avoided so far a third world war. However, we have not been able to rid humanity from the scourge of war and uh, from conflicts. Hundreds of interstate or intrastate conflicts have taken place uh, and millions of lives have been lost. The 20th century has been characterized by historians as the age of genocide or the beastly century, during which uh, nearly 150 uh, million people died as a result of wars, which too often were uh, devastating for the civilian populations, or as a result of the brutal and genocidal policies of dictators that caused untold human losses destruction, displacement, and famine in many parts of the world. The 21st century has already confronted the tragic consequences of at least 30. Um, this is um, about uh, two months ago. Uh, the, the, the numbers uh, probably has increased since then. Um, in different parts uh, of the uh, globe, 30 conventional conflicts uh, as well as horrific acts uh, of terrorism and other unconventional conflicts creating unprecedented threats to humanity. With the tragic events of uh, September 11, a new era of war has awakened and we see it now spreading mostly in Northern Africa and uh, in the Middle East. The human toll from the 21st century wars cannot match the uh, previous centuries' genocidal dimensions. Nevertheless, the loss of life, enforced uh, disappearances, displacement of uh, people within countries and refugee flows of unprecedented proportions, the material damages estimated at trillions of US uh, uh, dollars, farming disease, as well as the dissolution of the social fabric with the destruction of the most fundamental social services characterize the situation prevailing in most conflict uh, countries today. If one adds uh, the psychological wounds uh, and the trauma from the loss or disappearance of loved ones from the rapes and torture in the hands uh, of uh, belligerents, insurgent uh, groups uh, and terrorists, then we are able to grasp the full dimension of the devastating human-made uh, tragedy that has shattered societies and crippled people's lives and dreams. Since the end of the Cold War, uh, numerous agreements, peace agreements, including about 40 comprehensive peace accords have been signed to end long-lasting uh, armed conflicts. However, not all of these agreements uh, have been successfully implemented. Some have since collapsed and were succeeded by resurgence of uh, violence, falling in the conflict trap uh, that characterizes uh, many countries that have suffered from civil war. Others, notwithstanding, have uh, resulted in lasting peace. So the question arises, um, what makes the difference? How can we lastingly end a conflict? How can we improve the chances that a peace process will succeed? Is peacemaking, good offices, peace agreements, and peacekeeping adequate 
uh, for a stable peace? I will argue not. Uh, so what then are the indispensable components for uh, building lasting peace in war-torn societies and for laying the foundations for sustainable development, democracy, and human rights? I will argue that one indispensable component for the effective implementation of peace agreements and for sustainable peace remains reconciliation. I consider reconciliation as the ultimate goal of peace building and the most important ingredient for a stable peace. I will therefore try to briefly elaborate on the need to build bridges and change perceptions about the adversary to try to seek the truth about past human rights violations and atrocities and to try to understand the point of view of the other, let alone accept the others suffering and pain as one's own, as necessary characteristics for reconciliation. The recent death of Nelson Mandela, the tireless fighter for racial and social equality, freedom and justice, has reminded us all of the incredible strength of reconciliation, of the miracle of healing wounds and forgiving, of seeking the truth in order to be able to build a future without hatred. He was the leader who with vision and with wisdom led his country from a racist apartheid system of white domination and racial hatred, from bitter division, from deep rooted enmity and bloodshed to a country of forgiveness and the common homeland for all its citizens in a multicultural and multiracial society a rainbow nation, as he called it. It's a beautiful word. He, was, he has been and will remain the icon of reconciliation, human rights, democracy, freedom, and peace. I wish to pay special tribute to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, a process that lasted for two years under the wise chairmanship of, Randy, of Reverend Desmond Tutu, during which up to 22,000 men and women relieved their pain and loss of loved ones, and hundreds of perpetrators dared to open the wounds of guilt and to confess their crimes and ask for forgiveness and mercy from the relatives of the victims. This truth-telling mission was able to start the healing process uh, of the wounds of history, based on which a new South African nation would be born, founded on unity, on trust, tolerance, and mutual respect. Reconciliation generated the new spirit that has been nurturing democracy and peaceful coexistence while paying full respect to the wealth of diversity. Desmond Dutu summarized the very essence of reconciliation in the following words of wisdom, and I quote, there is no handy roadmap for reconciliation. There is no shortcut or simple prescription for healing the wounds and divisions of a society in the aftermath of sustained violence. Creating trust and understanding between former enemies is a, supreme, a supremely difficult challenge. It is, however, an essential one to address in the process of building a lasting peace. Examining the painful past, acknowledging it, and understanding it, and above all, transcending it together in the best way, is the best way to guarantee that it does not and cannot happen again, unquote. Especially in intractable conflicts, a certain narrative of the conflict is created, which nurtures a separate collective memory that tries to legitimize the cause of one side against the cause of the other side. Such collective memory is considered as the sole and undeniable truth, which is passed on 
to succeeding generations through history books and other narratives. In most cases, such narratives are not telling the whole truth. They are biased and selective, thus distorting historical accounts by omitting facts or past events or by putting emphasis on other events which tend to justify the group's actions. Usually, an image is created that each group is the victim, while the other is the oppressor, the perpetrator, and the wrongdoer. There is, only, there is also an effort to justify uh, and glorify the actions of one group while vilifying and uh, uh, delegitimizing the actions of the other group. Such collective narratives and uh, selective memories tend to perpetuate a conflict, preventing healing of the wounds and of past sufferings and serving as a barrier towards eventual reconciliation. This is why it is of utmost importance in such situations of intractable conflicts for the parties involved to move courageously towards uncovering and facing the truth in order to facilitate the process of reconciliation, which is built when both sides not only get to know, but when they truly acknowledge what happened in the past and are able to acknowledge also the pain and the suffering of the other. According to Amnesty International and the United States um, Institute for Peace, truth commissions or truth and reconciliation commissions have been established in more than 30 countries as official, temporary, fact-finding bodies to investigate a pattern of abuses of human rights and of humanitarian law, including crimes over a particular period of time or of a specific uh, uh, conflict and to establish the truth. They allow victims, they allow relatives of the victims, as well as perpetrators to give evidence of such human rights violations and abuses, thus providing a forum for their accounts to be heard. Most commissions conclude their work with a final report containing findings of fact, but more importantly, containing recommendations on steps to prevent a recurrence of past abuses. During the proceedings before such truth commissions, victims are able to present their personal testimonies of suffering, which becomes a site of redemption and of moral accountability. Truth-telling and recounting verbal memories of violence and trauma on the part of the victims and or their relatives helps to establish an independent account of events and to bring forward uh, to, uh, uh, and to clarify facts about past human rights violations and to provide information and evidence about enforced or involuntary disappearances. When people come forward and are able to talk freely about uh, their suffering and about their pain, and when perpetrators come forward to confess publicly without fear of recrimination, then truth is uncovered. And the possibility of closure and of healing uh, can uh, begin. Thus, truth commissions may serve as a catalyst in promoting social healing, leading to reconciliation and forgiveness. Forgiveness was central in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in uh, South Africa, aimed at healing the wounds of hatred and of anger that had been bred by the apartheid regime and the apartheid system. In the new democratic society of South Africa that emerged there was no place for reprisal. Desmond Tutu, the chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, noted that he had actually, and I quote, witnessed so many incredible people 
who despite experiencing atrocity and tragedy have come to a point in their lives where they were able to forgive, unquote. The daughter of uh, one of the victims of a gruesome murder is one such example of the need for truth and for forgiveness. When she was asked whether she would be able to forgive the people who inflicted such pain to her and to her family, she replied, and I quote, we would like to forgive, but we would just like to know who to forgive, unquote, and thank you very much. Thank you.